Welcome back to Get in the Mecca, and in today's episode, we are back talking about anime, of course. And this week, it's a bit of a different episode. I want to zoom in on an uh, on a very specific episode of anime this time, which makes it quite an, a niche episode, but also uh, one where I can really zoom in on some things. And that is Sonny Boy episode eight. If you have been listening to this podcasts lately i did tackle sunny boy a few episodes ago on that episode called dissecting sunny boy i think it was episode 97 if i'm not too wrong or something around that and we spoke very generally about the first few episodes of sunny boy and what they have to offer we spoke about politics in some respects we spoke about the direction we spoke about of course series director shingo natsume and his approach on this anime And this time, I'm still going to be talking kind of-ish about these things, but we're going to dive deeply into this specific episode, episode 8. This is a very special episode of the show, and it's probably the best so far. By the way, when I am recording this, we are up to episode 10, so I'm not going to speak too soon and say it is the best episode, but it's definitely one of my favorite episodes from this year, and I want to talk about why exactly that is the case. So without further ado, here is the episode for this week. That is episode 102 of Gats and the Mecca, a look into Sonny Boy episode 8. Before we really dive into how this episode is constructed and what it's all about, we have to of course talk about who is on it and who has been on it before. And of course this series is directed by of course Shingo Natsume, a name which I'm sure you guys are quite familiar with, mainly because of course he's the director of stuff like One Punch Man, Boogie Pop, Space Dandy, but also I harp on about his name a bit too often <laughs> online. But this episode is a bit different. This, Even though not every episode in this series is storyboarded, of course, by Shingo Natsume himself, that's how every anime on TV works, or most anyway. Um, this episode is storyboarded by a man called Keishiro Saito, whose first storyboard episode on this show was Sonny Boy episode 3, which is called The Cat Who Wore Sandals. And my expectations for this series had already been surpassed by that. That episode was my favorite so far at that point, and probably my second favorite episode in the series so far as well as episode 1. It was everything from the lighting to the um, to the debut animation direct on that episode as well, Nobuhide Korea, and their really sharp corrections and the close-ups in that episode. From a visual level, this was a incredible episode. Episode three, even though narrative-wise it might not be the biggest one in the show, it's one that definitely stood out to me for quite a few reasons. From there on, Gehishiro Saito already made their mark on this anime, and I was thoroughly impressed already. I was already thoroughly impressed with their work on Aka 13 regards the prequel to, not prequel, sorry, the almost epilogue to the Aka 13 series that was a phenomenal conclusion and I think really wrapped things together nicely for a series which I thought was was overall quite good but I feel like episode 12 didn't quite finish everything and Saito's boards on that final episode really just put everything to perspective and wrapped it up nicely so I already had pretty high expectations going into these episodes and they were already surpassed. However, when we move on to his second storyboarded episode being Laughing Dog, which is episode 8, and what we're talking about today, I found out that they had simply so much more to give, and episode 3 was just the tip of the iceberg, uh, which, from a viewer's perspective, when you're watching week by week, you don't really know what to expect, and you feel like they, obviously, every art, I'm sure every artist gives it their all, but it feels like everything they offered in episode 3 was just the prequel to what would be episode 8, which was a, if I'm just going to be honest, a masterpiece, in my opinion. Episode 8 pretty much tackles the very melancholic backstory of a dog known as Yamabiko, who is, I'm sure you know him because you watch the show if you're listening to this podcast but it tells the very sad tale of that dog uh, who was formerly human. And I'm not really going to get into the story, that is. I want to talk more about the technical stuff because I think think a lot of people, I'm sure, will be talking about 
the narrative stuff in this, well, when talking about episode eight and how good it is. But I, I do want to do something perhaps a bit different. <laughs> uh, we are on YouTube after all. And so that's really the aim for this podcast to talk about the technical mastery of this episode, or at least how I understood that and, and deliver that to you guys. Again, just a bit more context before you really dive in here. I feel like Sunny Boy is somewhere in the middle between Boogie Pop and Aka 13. Boogie Pop more so in the way that you can really grasp the flair of the individual artists on it, like Saito and so on, who has a pretty good episode on that show. I I watched about half of Boogie Pop. I'm gonna be honest. I didn't finish it, but I'm going to after Sunny Boy probably go back to it since I am working my way through every Shingun Azume directed work and I'm almost complete. Besides that one storyboarded episode of Umi Monogatari and um, not Horemia, but the um, the OVA that came before Horemia, I still have that to finish and, and a few other things. But Boogie Pop is definitely on my list. And yeah, so Boogie Pop definitely, I think, Natsume really allows some of these artists to shine, like Saito, for example. But I also feel like visually this show, Sunny Boy, really reminds me of Aka 13, just from the aesthetic point of view. Sunny Boy, in my view, kind of converges these two ideas where you have the artistic flair of someone like Saito, which is really shining in this show, but it also has that similar aesthetic that we know Shingo Natsume for. And so it's kind of, it, it's a really great opportunity, I think, to tell some really great stories. And I think Saito's episode is pretty much the product of that. And it, this strategy of allowing creatives to kind of just be creatives, I think paid off extremely, extremely well. And that's why this episode is one of my favorites in 2021 so far. Let's dive into the sort of preliminary credits for this episode. Uh, three main credits I just want to quickly mention. We have, obviously this episode is Laughing Dog, Sonny Boy episode eight, which is storyboarded directed or at least supervised in terms of having an episode director and animation directed. <laughs> I don't know if I can say it, but we have an animation director. All of those are credited to Kei Shiro Saito. And then obviously for this show, we have series director Kantoku Shinko Natsume, who also did the screenplay as well for this episode and just this show as a whole from my understanding. And then art director Marie Fujino. It's also important to note that the backgrounds for all of the show are done at Studio Pablo as well. The first thing I really want to touch on is the sort of emptiness that this episode has. Saito really enhances the underlying feeling of emptiness and isolation that was present in the previous episodes. The director really builds on these like critical components in, in Shigun Natsume's visual toolkit, like these empty backgrounds or solid backgrounds. Shigun Natsume seems to be a really big fan of solid colors uh, to back the characters, and it looks really beautiful and kind of in a way that I haven't really seen before. And Saito really builds on that. We get these white backgrounds or uh, very lightly painted and dusted uh, backgrounds in this episode. And it kind of show it makes it feel so hollow. Uh, and it's like no one is there when, and the thing is these backgrounds will show when someone is in the middle of a conversation. So it's not to say that no one is there, but it reminds us how empty this place is and how lonely they truly are. There is no one coming for them and they're kind of just left to fend for themselves in the face of adversity. And I, I think sometimes in Sonny Boy generally, you can, you get to that point to which you feel, okay, maybe this isn't so bad. Yeah, we're trapped on this island, but there are some good times to be had. Um, there is friendship, there is, there are all these other things, but Saito reminds us of the very dark reality, which is, we're trapped on an island or we're trapped in these worlds and we can't really get back to our world. Yes, we can transport and move between worlds, but we're pretty much stuck here. And that is pretty dark. And this episode as a whole is pretty dark, generally. From a spatial point of view, you know we love talking about space on this podcast all the time, but I, and I had to mention it here as well. From a spatial point of view, the emptiest shots, in my opinion, are probably the most fascinating ones where there's almost, I don't see nothing in the frame, but we'll have, say, two characters talking, and then everything else would kind of be, quote, empty space. There's nothing incredibly significant we should be looking at besides them, 
and it really shows how irrelevant the characters are. But I, I do say this for this episode, and it's true, yes, but you have to consider that this episode is cut kind of into two sections that go next to each other. We have, of course, the timeline of Yambika's story, which is taking place hundreds of years into the past, or is hundreds of years in the past. And then we also have, of course, the main characters who are uh, experiencing the story or listening to the story in the present. But weirdly enough, I think by having the present and the past next to each other, the past kind of makes the present feel much more lonely. By Saito using, as he said, all these like white backgrounds and very hollow looking shots, we can kind of, imp that's kind of also imposed on the footage in the present as well, which also feels awfully lonely after a while. And I think that Sunny Boy eventually was starting to feel much more homely. Like, I, I can get used to this place a bit. I want them obviously to escape and experience something outside of this mysterious world or the worlds in which they're in. But with everyone gone now and graduated, it, it kind of hit really hard when you realize that they're alone, or they, they can be really alone. There aren't as many people as you think in this world, and we're quite tiny little beings within it. I think Saito's episode as a whole really reconfigures how you think of Sunny Boy, at least it did for me. I can't speak for everyone, of course, but it, it really did for me and how the past kind of affected the present, and now my view of the present is very different, and this show just feels much more lonely than it did before when I was actually starting to warm up to it and the place and everything it had to offer. And now it feels much more hostile and cold <laughs> and unforgiving. This is kind of building off of the visual toolkit of Shingo Natsume again, but I think Saito takes it a bit further and it's how you have these differing or very extreme camera distances. You have these very discreet wide shots, which kind of feel like surveillance cameras in ways, even though they're not, it's more so, it's like if you were to put a camera into the creak of a door or just like through a, a pothole or something, it feels like it's not supposed to be there or it's spying on whoever is on the other side of it. It feels incredibly natural, but also kind of scary in a way. Uh, it, it shows where the students reside in and kind of shows that very, well, it gives us this unfiltered insight into the very grim reality of living through an epidemic, which they're going through day by day. Um, one of my favorite shots, personally, in this entire episode, maybe my favorite shot, alongside the stuff in the final um, scenes of this episode, is when they are, well, it's just one shot. I think it might even just be a complete painted background. Um, when you see the kids all at the table or some of them at the table through the doorway and they're all just like at the dinner table eating, it's really dark. <laughs> uh, and you can tell morale is going down slowly. And so even, not even slowly, morale is already down when you know you're trapped for that long. And Saito constantly feeds us this information and his his directorial style is just full of reminders when it comes to this episode anyway. And they're very subtle hints, but they mean a lot. And once you take those in, this episode feels or gets pretty dark quite quickly. On the other hand, though, you have these extreme wide shots, which kind of do the exact opposite. Okay, it does, both of them do feel uncomfortable, but I'd say Saito's wide shots feel extremely uncomfortable, but in a really good way. I think these feel really effective because when you have other storyboard artists like Shinko Natsume and Kawajiri, which kind of stay a bit more distant to their subjects, that that is no criticism. I think it's a very important part of Sunny Boy and why it feels so naturalistic or natural because it just, it feels like you're actually just watching people on an island survive. You're not in their heads. There's a lack of inner monologue, of course. And then the diegetic sound as well. Everything kind of just feels very strips back and bare. And they do a really good job of that. But Saito is I almost the opposite in some respects. He goes really up close with the camera and his storyboards. He's really present and right there to really investigate the characters and focus on specific body parts and parts of the face. One of my personal favorite shots in this episode 
is when Kodama and, of course, Yamabiko are talking and we zoom into Yamabiko's eye. And, of course, this is anime. We do have things like this where we speed into someone's eye or we have moments where we focus on just an eye. If you're aware of the work of, say, directors like Akiyuki Shimbo, for example, or Tatsuya Oishi and so on, this is a commonplace. This isn't something I'm claiming to be new. But the way this is done really took things to another level. We zoom into the eye and then it closes and then it opens and we zoom right in. It's like we're literally inside their eyeball. And I don't know how to describe that experience. It feels kind of surreal. And this episode, in a lot of ways, kind of feels surreal. And I, I think that kind of relates to how it, you kind of don't believe that when you are on an island with a pan, with an epidemic on your hands, you don't believe that it'll be you. <laughs> and the same thing with when you have this whole being called war. I don't even know if I can call him a human. <laughs> this whole being called war who has so-called scars and everything. Everything just feels incredibly surreal. And you would never imagine that you'd be in such a situation. You were simply just a normal high school student or uh, whatever student you were, just living your life. And next minute, you know, you're transported into this world of madness and almost infinite possibility. Uh, infinite possibilities and obviously a good thing in in many cases but uh, this episode has that very surreal feeling to it and that shot kind of summarizes exactly how I feel about it it's extremely out of the ordinary and uncomfortable this episode really explores the uncanny nature of human facial features and takes advantage of the plot point at hand being the epidemic like when we zoom into Kudama's facial features as well and we see her lips as well which are really dry and crackled and we zoom obviously into her eyes as well we zoom to all these different parts and even though her beauty is often being discussed it's very much the opposite and that's also part of that uncomfortable feeling by contrasting of course dialogue with visuals as well they're pointing out the hypocrisy basically in what they're saying or at least the contradiction there and seeing that dynamic as well is extremely complex and this episode overall is very complex visually but that's really why I love it. I know I've been speaking a lot about how this episode feels like an extension of a lot of Shingun Asume's visual tools but I would also like to point out how this episode of course storyboard by Keichiro Saito manages to really differentiate itself and their episodes as a whole manage to differentiate themselves from the rest of the show in many good ways and from their collaborators. This episode really sets itself apart in my opinion from the perspective of lighting. I, I just love the lamp lighting and the artificial light in this episode and I just love how it coats the very periphery of their face and, and their arms and so on but it doesn't go into all of them it's uh, you, you you could say it kind of fits into that contrasting theme between the very flat backgrounds and obviously being into the animation and so on but uh, i i could read into it in many different ways but i think that would take too long to discuss obviously on this podcast but let's just say it, it looks really great this episode kind of makes me feel watched and seen because of how realistic it feels in quite a few aspects. I do understand that I did just say before, I'm going to hold my hands up high, I did say this episode feels very surreal, but at the same time it feels incredibly real as well when yeah, because coming out of the mud and you see the light on Kodama and everything it just feels very down to earth and in tune with the environment and kind of more so what you'd expect from this island setting perhaps versus what I expected from that of say um, the Shingun Atsume boarded episodes earlier on uh, where this uh, this island was really like a jack-in-the-box but Keishiro Saito's storyboarded episodes kind of bring it back to reality or a much darker reality that you would expect for being trapped on an island like this and yeah it just it really brings things back to reality and back home as I mentioned before. I think episode 3 and episode 8 just run home another really important thing about anime in general and that is the importance of animation direction and I think it's something that perhaps from the, uh, I don't want to say casual, that's not the term, but I mean from say someone that doesn't look at credits which is a lot of people which is totally fine of course, 
animation direction probably isn't something that stands out too much or not something you really realize until until it's really drastic and then you'll say like the animation completely changed and that is really down to again animation direction and when we look at the episodes of Saito be it episode three with Nob Hit at Korea the really sharp lines and then we go to episode eight which is which has animation director of course Keishiro Saito you get a really different feeling and one person can really change the entire feel of an episode and bring it more towards what it's trying to convey and episode eight which again i would say is kind of a mixture between i would say the much sharper look or a much more defined look of korea and the much softer look of say someone like keita nagasaka or reiko nagasa for example it's somewhere in the middle for me and I, but I would say more so when we get into the close-ups as well, those feel really sharp and defined. And that is what this episode needs. And I just really wanted to say that these this is a really important thing to look at. And Saito's control over this episode really brings it f- further towards the message in which they're trying to convey, which is that very personal loneliness that one feels internally when they've been <laughs> away from the world in which they live for so long. And this episode and all the things around it from a visual standpoint do a really great job of doing that and animation direction is just one of those things. Let's kind of wrap this podcast up a bit. What makes Laughing Dog a quote masterpiece in my opinion, so to speak anyway, what it really is for me is how it gives, I think it's really what creative, creative driven projects should be all about and how it gives creatives the freedom to really provide their own artistic vision and twist on the story at hand. And obviously that's going to be within the limits of said production, but I really love anime like this, and Shingo Natsume has done this before. Um, Of course, he was Kantoku for Space Dandy, which is (laughs) and One Punch Man as well, which are two shows which are kind of known for that, where... Every episode kind of has its own twist to it. It has its own artistic flair and twang to it. And Sonny Boy might not be exactly that, but it definitely has part of that within it. And that's one of the reasons why I really love it. And these shows boarded, or sorry, headed by Shingo Natsume. In this case, Keishiro Saito offers an uncomfortable look into the worlds of Sonny Boy and how lonely this world can really feel. They push that to the max. And it's in a way in which I never really thought we'd experience in this show. It's It pushes it to its edge when uh, when you feel like there is really no hope for surviving this world and after being in it for so long. It's something that I really never thought this show would explore and I'm really glad I was able to witness it. This episode is visually engaging and also just a really great example of the power of original anime and again creator driven projects. With that being said that is the episode for this week. I apologize if this, okay, two things actually. So I apologize one if this episode is coming out quite late, which it likely is. I'm going to try and get my schedule back together. It is a bit of a mess right now, I'm not going to lie. But I will eventually get there and I think we'll eventually start getting back into Friday episodes or like early Saturday episodes, something like that. It's just been a bit hectic lately, but I'm going to try and fix that as best I can. And secondly, if this episode was also kind of an article that I wrote, I kind of reconfigured it a bit. And so I'm sure if you read the article, which you can read, that'll be in the link in the description. It's just a blog post of mine that I wrote like in a few days, uh, like a week ago about Sunny Boy episode eight. If you did read the article, then you probably noticed a lot of similarities because I was reading it in part while mixing it with my own thoughts. But yeah, so hopefully you enjoyed that. I know some people like listening to articles in audio form. And so I do try to convert the articles that I write for my own blog into these sorts of podcast type things because some people like the interaction more so but anyway thanks for listening and i will see you next week on or hopefully next week on episode 103 the music in this production goes as follows mandatory overtime by joth and synthwave by alex by alex mcculloch